Hi folks, today I'm going to take you through adding MIDI to this Roland CR68. This is the little brother to the CR78, which is the programmable drum machine. This is uh, the non-programmable version where you can dial up patterns, play them, um, adjust your tempo, all that sort of stuff. It doesn't have the volume faders that you have on the CR78, but as far as sounds go, you can do many similar things and you can uh, it sounds the same as the CR78. Uh, and we're going to add MIDI to it. So what we have here is this MIDI kit. This is from CHD Electro Service in the Czech Republic, and it's called the CRX8M, which works with both the CR68 and 78. Adds MIDI and lots of other funky things, MIDI clock control and that sort of stuff. So here are all the bits. This is the board that's going to go inside. It's a really good kit actually, it comes with the screws and everything you need, brackets, mounting bits and pieces, ribbon cables, everything's in there ready to go. So an important first step before I start modifying anything is to check what state it currently is in because then I'll be able to work out if it's something that I've done that stopped it from working or not. So we're going to turn it on, check all the functions, make sure everything is as it should be. Uh, if there's any problems there, I'll fix them first. I'll go through and replace whatever components need to be replaced to be fixed before I go and start modifying it, just so then we know exactly where we're at. So using the handy template that came with it, I've marked my positions on the back in relation to the screws. You can actually print it out and punch directly from the PDF, but it I couldn't print mine out to the exact scale. So yeah, I just decided to measure it freehand. That's what I've done. So flipping this over, I realize I've actually worked on this before because I remember wrapping it in cling wrap and putting the feet on while the cling wrap was on because I found them at the last minute before I delivered it back to the customer. So I'll unscrew these and clean them up before I give it back. So opening it up, I have worked on it before. It says here, serviced S8 in 2016. So three years ago now, I remember there was something not working. I think it was the kick drum. And I also marked these screws here with some nail polish to stop them from coming undone. Gave it a clean up. I remember recapping, I think, recapping it at the time, cleaning it up and calibrated it, so it should be in good nick. But we'll check it as well. So to remove the back panel, you need to take off the earth lead, which you just unscrew and unsolder the two wires from the power supply. Now around the back, I'm just gonna use a 12 millimeter metric socket to get the jacks off. These are really handy, these tools. You can go both directions and it's just a fast way of getting nuts undone. I always keep all my screws in a plastic container that I put a lid on and mark because I've got several jobs going on at the same time. It's amazing how at the time you think, oh, I'll remember which screw these goes with, you know, which, which screw goes where, but it's really easy to forget. Also, filming 
your repair, even if you're not going to share the video with anyone, really helps you remember what went where and you can always go back and look at the video again to see what you took out because things like these jacks here have got washers, spring washers on the back as well as a um, little insulator for the switch and insulating washers for the front and then the actual nuts. So you want to make sure you put it back exactly the way it was built. So there we go, there's our back panel removed. Next is we have to take off this circuit board here so we can undo these screws on the side and also take the knobs off the front. The next part is you have to unsolder these two power wires and also the orange and black ones on this side as well. I've actually marked them with a marker so I remember O and B for orange and blue and B and W for black and white. With those unsoldered the whole thing just flips open so you can get to the inside boards. The next step is to swap out this LED with a three pin multicolored LED that comes in the kit. I'm just going to use a solder sucker because you don't have to apply as much heat to these old boards. I prefer these to solder braid because it doesn't get so hot and with these old circuit boards it's really easy to lift tracks. And now I'm just going to put my new LED in. Next take one of the ribbon cables, they're both the same. This one has four of the, the last 12 through to 16 connectors cut off, they're not going to be used, so just trim those off. So the ribbon cable is now on. So everything's back together. Actually wasn't the easiest thing because this revision of this board here, which is called the GL10, in the service notes, for the installation for the MIDI board, it talks about revisions A and B. Well, this is actually has no revision. Uh, it must be a very early one, and it has this OP33 board on top, which has an extra transistor and some resistors, and none of the components on these boards are marked at all. So I've had to compare circuit diagrams and look at resistor values to try to work out which chips were the ones that the installation notes were referring to. So made it a little bit tricky, but uh, I just have to go through it one by one and make sure that every single wire, the correct wire of the ribbon cable went onto the correct parts of the circuit. And the little board sits down there. And the back panel, so that's what's new, MIDI in, MIDI out, and a little switch that determines your sync mode, whether it's internal sync or external. Um, I haven't done these up yet because I'm just going to check it all, make sure it's good before I finish it. But yeah, really neat little uh, MIDI board. And let's try it out. When drilling the holes for the back panel, I use my favorite bestest buddy step drill. These are brilliant. You might remember from the start, the accent knob was scratchy. So you really need to spray these out twice. Um, what I do is put some paper towel to soak up all the nasties, spray it like mad all the way inside and through the front of the pot as well and leave it for a while and then give it another spray um, and then turn it to clean it out. You really need to do it a few times. The first time just sort of softens up the junk and contaminants and the second spray actually washes it out. So you need to do it more than just once. If you just do it once, it'll go scratchy again as soon as it dries out. So we're all back together and let's check out how this works. So um, turn it on and I heard power up, which is always a good sign. The light on the front now, when we're in the middle position here, uh, it works just like it did before. Start and stop rhythms, we can control tempo. All that sort of stuff works exactly as normal. When we put the switch to the far right, 
it goes green, and now I'm actually controlling it via external MIDI clock. So I've basically just connected the MIDI in uh, to it from my sequencer, and then in my sequencer settings, set the MIDI clock to go out of that MIDI port so that the 68 can receive it. And when I hit play on my sequencer, you'll hear a very famous CR68 pattern. Blondie Heart of Glass. So that's, um, that's that pattern there playing, starting and stopping perfectly in sync. Now I can change patterns. Any of these patterns. I can change the balance. Accent. Volume. Everything works as normal. Um, even fill-ins. So I can go select a fill. And so forth. Stop the sequencer and it stops, which is great. The other thing you can do is put the switch in the other position, and now it just acts as a sound module, tone generator. So I can play bass drum, snare drum, hi-hats here on my MIDI controller, and program it completely as a separate sound source. So that's it. So really, I'm not the brains behind this. It's obviously um, a really slick, beautiful design and the, uh, the guy who created it is uh, a genius. It's fantastic. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you've got any questions, ask below and um, follow the link to the MIDI kit if you want to get one for yours, but worthwhile I reckon. So there we go, labelled the back of it. And I think this is a bit of a story here of some irony. I just went out to get um, some replacement tape for my Dymo and the guy said, oh, look, the tape's too expensive so we don't sell that tape anymore. But I can sell you this machine for $2.50, which actually is better because it's three-dimensional type printout, so it's sort of uh, raised old style, um, $2.50. But he said, but we don't sell the tape. So once the tape runs out, you chuck it in the bin. I mean, what is going on with this world where you can't even afford the spare parts I just think it's ironic that here I am restoring an old piece of gear and making it modern because people love old stuff and they want to be able to use it. And meanwhile, we're creating things like this where it's too expensive to even replace the tape. I mean, God, am I sounding old here or what? I just think that's bizarre that, um, yeah, you've got a, a, all these young guys which, who rightly so want to keep an old piece of gear like this going, which is great. And the other side of it, you've got an industry that uh, is confused and doesn't know what it wants to provide. Hmm. Well, I hope my son is uh, one of the people who grows up to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Anyway, that's my little rant. I just think it's ironic. What you need to do is basically, in this is in logic anyway, but it's really the same in every door, is go to set your preferences, MIDI, and then make sure you've got your sync transmit MIDI clock turned on, and you can just set it to all ports or just the specific port that your device is connected to, and that will make sure that you're transmitting MIDI clock so when you start and stop the door, the sequencer, it starts and stops any device like the CR68. So that's basically it. So I watched that video video back and saw how grubby the front panel was with the glue around it, so I've given it a bit of a clean up. The problem I had was that nothing would stick to this surface. So I had to actually use a bit of hot glue underneath these labels to get them to stick. So it's funny sometimes on playback of video you go, oh, yuck. So that's ready to go now. Just thought I'd show you the differences between the CR68 and my CR78. So on the 78, you have things like, you know, volume controls for the tambourine and the guiro and the metallic hi-hat and so forth, and the programmable section here, and also voice cancel, so you can turn off kick drum, snare drum, clubs, uh, and the hi-hat. So yeah, world's first programmable drum machine. Also, this fade in and out. You just hit um, yeah, start, and it will fade in to a pattern or fade out at the end. 
So that's the CR78 versus the CR68. And one of the great stories about the CR78 was that when they Roland first released it, they gave one to Phil Collins and he thought, oh, this is pretty cool and started it up and shows a pattern, hit play and thought, oh, I can make a song out of this. And that was in the air tonight. So the irony is that it's the world's first programmable drum machine, but he just ended up using a preset. So I think that's pretty funny.